Good afternoon, and welcome to our webinar, A Practical Guide to the CARES Act for Architectural Firms. Thank you all for joining us, and please continue sharing your recommendations for programs at communications at architects.org. We'll share this contact information again at the end of the program. I'm Eric White, Executive Director of the BSA. And before we begin, I wanna share some important state and local news, as well as a quick update on what the BSA is working on to support you during this challenging time. Now, as you all likely know, the North Atlantic States Regional Council of Carpenters covering New England and New York has directed its members to stop working due to the health and safety concerns from the spread of the virus. This likely will shut down many other construction sites that have been in operation recently. Additionally, Boston Mayor Walsh has established several new guidelines, including a curfew between 9 p.m. and 6 a.m. until May 4th. You can find this information along with other local and national resources at architects.org. Also on the website, I wanna call attention to the firm's best practices guide to COVID-19 that was developed by our task force led by BSA president, Natasha Espada, AIA. And you'll also find there our work helping identify potential facility locations for the state to set up in response to COVID-19, including emergency healthcare, as well as isolation areas. And for now, we're planning on doing two webinars a week. We hope you will join us on Friday at noon for our webinar program with firm member HGA on healthcare facility design and COVID-19. And this is also a good time to remind you that our knowledge communities are coming back, holding their monthly meetings on virtual platforms, and we hope you'll, you'll look forward to joining these meetings from your home. We also welcome you to join BSA Connect, a LinkedIn forum. It's a place where you can post questions, share, and find community. And you can find it by searching for BSA Connect on LinkedIn. In addition to these, there are a number of advocacy efforts currently underway as we continue to work with our partners in the building industry and other AIA chapters across the US, and of course, with AIA National. Now, I'd like to take a moment to, to mention the opportunity to sponsor these and other BSA programs and activities. These webinars are responsive to our times, serve the greater good of the AEC community, and reach hundreds with each session. Now, just before we begin, there's a few rules. Because we have a large number of participants, you will all be on mute. Thank you all for your questions during registration. Due to the overwhelming response, we have selected a few key questions to address at this time. We will use your questions for more BSA programs coming up. And during the program, feel free to use the chat option on the lower middle right side of your screen to interact with other participants, as well as the Q&A option to ask questions directly of our presenters. And if time permits, they will try to answer. This session will be recorded and posted in the next day or two on the COVID-19 resource page on architects.org. And one final caveat, I'd like to acknowledge that because this pandemic is rapidly changing and in a dynamic phenomenon that no one has experience with, we are all trying to figure this out together. And that includes our technology. If we experience any technical difficulties during this presentation, please bear with us and we will do our best to resolve them as quickly as possible. Our conversation today is not intended to provide solutions or even definitive answers. There's no one size that fits all and many things are changing, but it is intended to support the community with knowledge sharing so that we can all move forward together. And now I'm excited to introduce our presenters. Stephen Minson, CPA MST, is a partner at DeChico Goldman and Company and leads their A&E business tax practice, as well as the firm's COVID-19 response. He is a member of the firm's A&E niche and has over 30 years of experience providing tax consulting, planning and compliance services to closely held business owners and firms. His expertise, includes consulting on tax incentives and multi-state tax matters. Rick Strout, CPA, is a principal at DeChico Goldman and Company and has over 20 years of experience providing tax, audit, and, audit and advisory services 
to closely held businesses in the architectural industry. Rick is a subject matter expert on the SBA PPP loan program, and especially given his previous experience as a CFO, he provides a unique perspective and insights. And now let me turn it over to Steve and Rick. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Uh, this is Steve Minson for uh, just, to, just so everybody is aware. Um, thanks to everyone for joining us today. Just a, a, a quick introduction about, about the firm. DGC has been a member of the BSA for over 15 years and we are currently a legacy circle donor. We truly value our association with, with the BSA. For those of you who aren't familiar with DGC, we're an accounting and business advisory firm with a robust architectural and engineering practice. At DGC, we specialize in services for individuals and privately held businesses. We provide tax, audit, accounting and advisory services, which include succession planning, litigation support, forensic accounting, valuation, and transaction advisory services. The accounting and business advisory practice provides CFO controller and business advisory services, as well as accounting and bookkeeping support. And our IT risk assurance and advisory practice provides IT audit, compliance, and cyber and information security services. I encourage you to visit our website, which has a dedicated page with sources related to coronavirus at dgccpa.com slash coronavirus. And now we can st we'll start the pre actual formal presentation. While the main focus of this presentation are the business aspects of the CARES Act, we thought we would start with a brief discussion of some of the individual tax law changes made, since these will help many people in some way. Please note we are not covering every change made, but are focusing on what we feel will be the most common changes utilized. Also, it's important to keep in mind that the provisions of the CARES Act were written and passed in an extraordinarily short time frame, probably as, as quick as I've ever seen a law passed, especially a, a tax law or a law that contains tax provisions. Just about any complex legislation has unintended drafting errors or provisions that don't seem to make sense. These need to be clarified through further guidance or, or actually formally corrected. While the CARES Act was signed into law only about a week and a half ago, we have already come across a number of these problematic areas. For this reason, we simply do not have all the answers right now, although we certainly will attempt to provide as much information as possible and, and, and respond to as many of your questions as possible. So let's start with some of the personal tax law changes that, that, have, that have applied here. First up are the stimulus payments or recovery rebates that eligible individuals should be receiving in the coming weeks. Since these have received so much publicity in the media, we won't spend too much time talking about them here and getting into the details. The amount of the stimulus payment will, will be determined based on information contained, contained in your 2019 personal tax return if already filed, or your 2018 tax return if 2019 has not yet been filed. And the IRS is expected to begin making these payments shortly. Next item is, is um, if, if people have undergone some hardships for financially, there are some tax favored withdrawals available from your retirement plans. Prior to the CARES Act, an early distribution, which was typically defined as a distribution made before the individual turns 59 and a half, was subject to a 10% penalty in addition to the normal income tax, although there were some limited exceptions that can get you out of the penalties. Now this new 10, this 10 percent penalty will not apply for a coronavirus related distribution of up to hundred thousand dollars that's made in tax year 2020 to an individual who meets any one of the following three tests. First, you have to have been diagnosed with SARS CoV2 or COVID-19 by a test approved by the CDC. Your spouse or dependent must have been diagnosed with either virus or you have experienced adverse financial consequences as a result of being quarantined, furloughed, or laid off work, or having hours reduced due to either virus, being unable to work because of lack of childcare, or the closing of, closing of one's own business. It's expected that this third test is more of a catch-all and will, will apply to most people. 
keep in mind the distribution is still subject to income tax. However, the income will be spread radically over three years beginning in 2020, unless you decide you wanna pay it all up front. However, if you choose to repay the distribution within three years, it's actually treated as if it was a, a normal rollover, which is not taxable. So if you repay the distribution within three years, you will not have to pay tax on the distribution. Um, although the mechanics of how that works are still to be determined because presumably uh, if you decide to repay that distribution in year three, you will have already begun paying taxes in years one and two. So the IRS will have to issue guidance. This is one of the many areas that I've mentioned where, where we need some, some more guidance. Uh, next item up is a temporary waiver of required minimum distribution rules. Many retirees are required to take a required minimum distribution or known as an RMD each year from their retirement plan based on life expectancy tables. The CARES Act suspends most RMDs for 2020. This might seem a little bit counterintuitive since many people may need the extra cash and, and those that are in need of the money can certainly take the distributions while those that don't need the money can forego the distributions. Uh, one, a couple of issues, a couple of reasons why this, this act was put into place or this piece of the law. Number one, the required minimum distribution is based on your account value as of the beginning of the year. And as has been painfully obvious to many people that are invested in the stock market, your account values are much lower right now than they were on January 1st. In addition, because of that extreme volatility in the market, Suspending the required minimum distributions provides an extra year for the investment portfolios to hopefully recover. Also, the, the wording in the CARES Act implies that it should apply to all retirement plans. Therefore, if you are currently receiving a required minimum distribution from an inherited IRA, we expect this change to also apply. Um, there's also a provision I, I, I don't know, I don't have on the outline and, and, and I didn't want to spend a lot of time on it, but there is also a, an increase in the amount of loans you can take from retirement plans um, that's increased to fit from 50,000 to 100,000. So if, if that's an option for you, uh, those are rules that you may want to look into further. From a charitable contribution standpoint, the CARES Act provides for a new above the line deduction up to a maximum of $300 for 2020. So anyone can take a deduction for contributions made even if you do not itemize deductions. In addition, if you do itemize and make significant contributions, the normal lim limitation, which there are several of, but the most common of which is that you can normally only take a deduction up to 50% of your adjusted gross income. These limitations are waived for 2020. So in effect, your charitable contributions can be significantly increased, obviously, if you're in a financial position to do so. However, in an effort to get hands, the, the money into the hands of charities that are likely suffering as much, if not more than anyone, the limitation is only available for contributions made directly to the charities and not to contributions made to private foundations or donor advised funds. Typically, those, those contributions made to private foundations or the donor advised funds often sit in those accounts for some period of time before they're actually paid out to the charity. So, the, the whole purpose here is to get money to the charities as soon as possible. Now I'd like to talk to some, some um, about some business tax changes that may, that may be impacting you. And a lot of these are mainly with the intent of getting some, some needed cash flow into the businesses. Before I dive into these tax law changes from the CARES Act, I do want to note there was some payroll tax credits that were enacted as part of the Families First Coronavirus Relief Act, which was passed a few weeks ago and now seems like a lifetime ago. But in the grand scheme of things, these are relatively minor credits. And since the focus of this presentation is the CARES Act, we won't spend time on these other than to let you know they're out there and available to businesses with less than 500 employees who have made payments under the Emergency Family and Medical Leave Act or the paid sick leave provisions of that legislation. The question of whether an employee is eligible for these new types of paid leave is really an HR decision, although the related tax credits are an issue for your accounting and tax advisors. So there's a little bit of a combination of things you have to deal with here. So from a business tax standpoint, as far as the CARES Act, 
there are two important payroll tax considerations. The employee retention payroll credit was added to encourage employers to retain employees and to maintain their salary for the remainder of 2020. The credit is taken against the employer's share of social security tax. That would be the 6.2% of wages paid. And the amount is actually fully refundable. The credit is equal. This has been a point of, of confusion, but it's, it's now been clarified. The credit is equal to 50% of qualified wages paid with the qualified wages paid being capped out at $10,000. So basically you can take a credit of $5,000 per, up to $5,000 per employee, 50% of, of the $10,000. And the credit applies only to wages paid after March 12th of 2020 and before January 1st of 2021. So basically an employee making more than $40,000 per year will only generate a credit for one payroll quarter. You can also add in an allocable share of healthcare costs paid by the company for an employee to increase the, the amount of the credit. However, the limit on wages plus health costs remains at 50% of $10,000. And before I get into some of the, the mechanics of the credit, um, an extremely important point, and we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit more in detail uh, later on. And this, this plays into the, um, the SBA loan program known as the Paycheck Protection Program, or, or PPP for short. It's important to note that if you wanna take advantage of the, of the employee retention payroll tax credit, but you have also taken a loan out under the PPP program, or you've claimed a work opportunity credit, which isn't all that common, but it does exist. But if you have taken either one of these benefits, you cannot take the employee retention payroll credit. So as I mentioned, Rick, Rick will talk about the PPP program shortly. And really this is the priority because it's, it's, it's a far more benefit to most businesses. Um, but these credits are available only if you do not qualify for the PPP or cannot obtain one for some reason. So if, if you fall into one of those categories, keep this payroll tax, employee retention payroll credit in mind, um, but it should not be your first priority. In order also, in order to qualify for the credit, there are some, some pretty strict re restrictions you must have either a full or partial suspension of business due to orders from an appropriate governmental authority that limits commerce, travel, or group meetings due to COVID-19. This may be the case for many non-essential businesses operating in Massachusetts, although some additional guidance would be helpful. Another option is you must have a year-over-year -year quarterly drop in gross receipts of at least 50% when compared to the same quarter last year. And you can continue until the quarter in which your gross receipts returns to at least 80% of the receipts for the same quarter in the prior year. So we hope that businesses don't see that much of a drop off, but it, it, certainly in some industries that will be possible and, and in fact, likely in many cases. However, just to complicate it even more, which this, these types of laws tend to do, if you had more than 100 full-time employees during, during 2019, that would be last year, only wages paid for employees not providing services dur during the quarter in, in which you meet either of the qualifying tests may be counted for purposes of determining the available credit. Whereas if you had 100 or fuller, I'm sorry, 100 or fewer full-time employees, you count all wages paid to your employees whether or not they're working. So this, this credit is, is clearly geared to, toward the smaller businesses and, and will generate more, more of a benefit there. Uh, also, you should know for purposes of the 100 employee test, certain related businesses must be aggregated. So if you have two businesses with 60 employees each, but they have the exact same owner, you may have to combine those, which would put you over 100 employees. So you'd fall into the first test where you can only take the credit for employees that are not currently working, but that you're still paying. Um, next item is the payroll tax deferral. And this sort of, this one um, to a large degree is a, again, there, there's a significant limitation related to the PPP program that we'll talk about. 
Um, however, this one is a, a is a nice little benefit. Again, if, if you don't if you don't qualify for under the, under the provisions, we'll discuss in a second. And this allows you to defer, not not to give up. You you do have to pay it back, but you can defer the employer's share of social security taxes. Again, the six point two percent that you've incurred between the date of enactment of the law, which was March twenty seventh, twenty twenty and December 31st, 2020. 50% of that amount deferred must be paid back by December 31st, 2021, with the remaining 50% paid by the end of 2022. However, you cannot participate in the program, the deferral program, if you have a Paycheck Protection Program loan that is forgiven. And Rick will get into the forgiveness rules shortly. These are um, extremely complex and, and confusing. Um, we expect most people taking the PPP loans will expect it to be at least partially forgiven. Um, so one option, so again, the mechanics of how that should work are, are very much unclear. But if you expect to participate in the PPP loan program, you probably should not or at least consider not participating in this payroll deferral because you just have to pay the money back. So again, IRS guidance is expected to clarify how this should be approached. Um, and, and one final note on the payroll tax deferral is that self-employed taxpayers can also participate in the program based on, their, on the self-employment tax that they pay on their personal income tax return. And finally, just a, a, a few other um, business tax changes that may be of benefit to your business. Uh, net operating losses is basically a benefit available to C corporations. The now two year old tax reform bill, which is known as the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, eliminated the ability to carry back business losses and also required that any carry forward of those losses could offset no more than 80% of your taxable income. The CARES Act backtracks on all that and provides a significant potential benefit by allowing for a five-year carryback of losses incurred in 2018, 2019, or 2020. And then if these losses are carried forward, they will be able to offset 100% of your taxable income rather than the 80% through 2020. There are some more technical details we won't dive into here and, and quite a bit more guidance is needed on some of the required reporting. But basically, C corporations that incur losses may be able to help the cash flow by carrying back losses against prior profitable tax years. Also, you should keep in mind that if you carry the loss forward, you will receive a federal tax benefit at the current tax rate of 21%. But if you're able to carry it back, you may receive a tax benefit at 35% although alternative minimum tax, which was still in place in those, of those years prior to 2018, may lower the effective rate of savings. As with many of these rules, proper planning must be performed to ensure you're getting the maximum benefit. There have also been some changes with respect to the business interest limitation rules. The Tax Cuts and Jobs Act allowed um, business, required that businesses could only deduct a limited amount of business interest, basically equal to 30% of your adjusted taxable income. And adjusted taxable income requires certain adjustments so that many architectural businesses are still able to deduct their interest expense in full. However, if you're not, the CARES Act increases the deduction to 50% of adjustable taxable income for 2019 and 2020, although partnerships specifically are not eligible for this increased limitation until 2020. So businesses that have that may have been limited could see some additional expenses freed up. And, and finally, um, one more topic in, in detail is with qualified improvement properties. And this is a technical correction to the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. When, when I initially started talking, I mentioned that complex legislation often contains uninten unintended drafting errors. And the tax treatment of qualified improvement property is a perfect example of this. When the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was passed, Congress clearly intended that qualified improvement property, which is defined as any improvement made to the interior portion of a non-residential building anytime after the building was placed in service, 
be eligible for bonus depreciation or the ability to deduct the full cost of those improvements in the year place and service. Alternatively, these could be written off over 15 years. Because of the drafting error, qualified improvement property instead was required to be depreciated over 39 years. This correction has been discussed for about two years now and has now finally been passed as part of the CARES Act retroactive to the effective date of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, which is for 2018. So again, in this case, many businesses may be able to generate a really significant additional deduction of the mechanics of how this needs to be reported are not yet clear. It is our understanding that the IRS is working to issue guidance in this area, as well as other areas as quickly as possible. And finally, before I turn it over to Rick, I just, I also wanted to mention many of you have probably heard about all of the tax deadline extensions. Um, the federal tax deadline for tax returns due April 15th has been extended to July 15th. That applies to individual returns as well as C corporations and, um, and trusts. The thing to watch out for is that states do not always follow these federal rules. And that this is where there's been a, a lot of problems. Uh, in particular, Massachusetts is being somewhat uncooperative in this area. Uh, with respect to C corporations in particular. Massachusetts is not extending the tax return due date for, for C corporations, so these are still due April 15th. What they have done is waived any penalties as long as the returns are filed and the payments are made by July 15th. However, they have not waived interest. So if you owe money and do not extend your tax return at April 15th for corporations only, C corporations, and you do owe tax, you will, and you will have some interest to pay. Although as long as you pay by July 15th, you won't have penalties. Uh, and there are several other states that unfortunately that are, that are not following the automatic July 15th due date. Um, so if you do have a multi-state tax return, those need to be watched out for. And with that, I will turn over the presentation to Rick. Okay, thank you, Steve. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rick Strout, and again, I'm a principal at DGC, and I have over 20 years of experience in working with privately held small to medium-sized businesses, including really a significant amount of time working with companies within the A&E space. So the purpose of this part of the webinar <clears throat> is to give you a summary of the, of the key provisions of the Paycheck Protection, Protection Program. And I'm gonna go a little fast through this because I think we might be a little bit behind at this point. I wanted to leave a lot of space at the end for, it, for the questions. <clears throat> so in general, this loan program allows for businesses to apply for and to receive loans under the SBA's 7A loan program. Um, so we're gonna talk about who is eligible to participate, how the loan is calculated, and some of the other key provisions. So, so who is eligible? If you could go back a slide, please. <clears throat> who is eligible? Any business is eligible under this loan program if the business has 500 employees or less. The business also needed to be in operation as of February 15th, 2020, and you have to have had uh, employees being paid salaries and wages at that time as well. An important part of this application process for the loan is that a representative of the business needs to certify that uncertain economic conditions makes the loan necessary. <clears throat> the representative also needs to certify that the loan amount of the funds that are received are actually going to be used to retain employees and to, and to make payroll payments, as well as to make you know, any, any mortgage payments or rent payments or utility. <clears throat> so how much can a business borrow? The amount of the loan is determined primarily by calculating what your average monthly payroll costs are and then multiplying that number by 2.5. So really the government here is essentially just, it, they're giving you funding that they think is enough to pay for approximately, you know, two and a half months or 10 weeks of, of payroll and employee benefits. The monthly payroll costs are calculated by taking an average of the calendar year 
that immediately preceded the loan's origination date. So what that means, in other words, you can use calendar year 2019 to figure out what your monthly payroll costs are. Next slide. Payroll costs, so specifically, how, you how do you define payroll costs? Payroll costs are defined as salaries and wages, commissions, vacation, sick or family leave pay, healthcare costs, retirement benefit costs, and then some state or local assessed uh, taxes assessed on employee compensation like, uh, like state unemployment tax would be a good example of that. However, the amount of the payroll cost is limited to $100,000 for each employee. I'll take you through a very simple example. Let's say an employee has a salary of $90,000 and the related health insurance costs that are paid by the employer totals about $20,000 in the calendar year. So that's a total of $110,000. But the total would be capped at $100,000 for that employee for these purposes. Um, so in that example, there would be $10,000 that would be excluded from this calculation. Now, one issue that we've uh, been really wrestling with this past week or so is whether or not the $100,000 cap should be applied against just the salaries and wages, and then you add in the health insurance and retirement benefit costs, or whether the $100,000 cap should be applied against the total all-in payroll costs, just similar to the example that I just, I just ran through with you. Unfortunately, the language within this act, and I think it's probably because it was just passed so quickly, um, as well as the subsequent guidance that came out of the Treasury Department and, and SBA, um, is very poorly written. Um, it, it, it's, it's led to a lot of ambiguity, a lot of confusion amongst, amongst accountants, amongst lawyers, and, and most importantly, amongst the lenders that are out there trying to execute this program. But as a firm, we've been wrestling with this definition, and as a firm, the consensus is that we're telling all of our clients to use this all-in approach that I, that I um, went over at, at, the, at the onset. And then, not to confuse matters any further for everybody, but there's also been a lot of confusion that we've seen in working with the attorneys, the clients, and the lenders over whether you can use a calendar year period for, the, for that look back period or whether you should use uh, the period that immediately precedes the loan origination date. So, for example, April 1st through 2000, uh, April 1st, 2019 through to March 31st, 2020. Lots of confusion as to what period to use in order to calculate your monthly payroll cost. But the SBA on Saturday night issued additional guidance saying that you should really be using the calendar year 2019 for your look back period. Um, we did see though, however, that last week you know, we, we saw applicants that were being told by their lenders to use a fiscal period, not the calendar year period. So honestly, I, I really think that the key here is to, is to communicate with your lender, communicate with the bank, and, and I would say be prepared with the data with, for, for each of the calculations, for both calculations, just to sort of expedite things. I mean, our recommendation though is that if your bank is adamant that you use the period from April 2019 to March 2020, I wouldn't push back. Uh, we, we believe it, and this is really just an opinion, but I would think that it's more important under the circumstances just to get that application in. Um, because obviously we're in a, we're in a time where, where you know, time is of the essence. And then getting back to the question of how much can a business borrow, um, you should know that the loan amount cannot be for any more than, and, than $10 million. And then some payroll costs that you do not include in the calculation would be any payments made to independent contractors and don't include any payments to employees that have a foreign principal place of residence.
So that's the loan calculation for businesses like corporations and LLCs and incorporated entities. So, but how do self-employed individuals calculate payroll costs? And the answer there is I think you, you need to take your net earnings uh, or, you know, from your P&L or from your Schedule C that you have from self-employment and add to that any salaries and wages from any employees that you might have working for you. And similar for how you treat incorporated businesses, the net earnings from self-employment uh, would be limited to $100,000 as well as that employee by employee limit of $100,000 for their payroll costs. Some other key provisions here is that the SBA will provide a 100% guarantee on the loan, but only through December 31st. After that, the loan guarantee reduces to its normal level of 75% guarantee. Um, the borrower will be able to defer payments on this loan for six months. Interest does accrue on the loan during the deferral period, uh, and there is no collateral there's no personal guarantees required from the borrower. Um, and the most important provision of this, of this loan package is the element of loan forgiveness. So this is a really important, essential part of this loan program. The, the amount of the loan forgiveness, initially anyways, is equal to the amount that's spent by a business during the eight week period following when you receive the loan or following the loan origination date. So specifically during that eight week period, any amounts that are spent on payroll costs uh, or interest payments on mortgages, rent payments on leases and utilities are totaled up. <clears throat> that total is your initial amount of loan forgiveness. Now, it, it's worth mentioning that any kind of prepayments of these costs are really not allowed uh, to be included in this calculation for kind of obvious reasons. So it's not permissible to go and prepay four months of rent and thinking that that's going to count towards loan forgiveness. So having said all this, there are a few factors that come into play that really could reduce your, your forgiveness amount that you need to be careful of. The first one is that no more than 25% of these total costs that are incurred during the eight week period may be for non payroll costs. So for example, let's say that your total loan amount that you receive is 200,000. And let's say of that 200,000, you spend 100,000 of it on payroll and then 100,000 on rent and utilities. So under these rules, like I said, no more than 25% of the loan amount. So that would be 200,000 times 25% would be 50,000. So, so no more than 50,000 should be spent on rent and utilities. So in that example, you know, you, you actually spent 100,000, you should have spent 50,000. So $50,000, which is the difference, ends up not being forgiven. So because of this, you know, uh, we're recommending to all of our clients that when you receive these loan proceeds, that you deposit them into a separate checking account if you can, or just open up a new checking account. And you also should, should be making all of those qualifying expense payments out of that same account. Um, that way it's a lot easier, uh, you know, to, to track that where you are with that 25% limit at any point in time. So then the other ways that this loan forgiveness can be, um, the amount of loan forgiveness could be reduced is that Congress, you know, Congress really wanted to give small businesses a substantial incentive to hold off on laying off their employees and to limit the extent to which they were reducing their employees' salaries and wages. So a way to accomplish this through the act is that they added, added a provision where, you know, It'll, it'll essentially reduce the amount of forgiveness if you lay off employees or reduce their salaries. So let's just say if, for an example, a very simple example, if an employer reduces its workforce by say 
And that loan forgiveness is going to be reduced by, you know, about approximately 30%. Um, and then there's a similar calculation that's in place for salary reductions. Only the loan forgiveness will be reduced to the extent that the salary reductions are more than 25%. So there's some fairly complex calculations out there in the language of the act. It's taken me about, well, it took me about five or six times to sort of digest it, but um, suffice to say that the calculation is really based primarily on number of FTEs that you've had during or before the crisis, I should say, versus the number of FTEs, full-time equivalents that you had um, during the crisis. So whatever that percentage is, that's, that's how much you risk um, having your loan forgiveness be reduced by. The good news here is that there is a cure period, which I'm sure you've heard about, where if the employer can reverse these layoffs and reverse those salary reductions by June 30th, so if you can get your full labor force back in the door by June 30th, then the reduction of that forgiveness is essentially reversed. And then lastly, I should mention that, uh, that the forgiveness, any forgiveness amount will not be considered taxable income for federal tax purposes. So really all in, if you think about it, this is a very generous sweetheart deal that, that Congress passed for, for small businesses. So then for those firms who weren't fortunate enough to receive 100% loan forgiveness, either because you, you had to reduce your headcount and you had to make those pay cuts in order to survive, then you would, you know, you'd be stuck with some sort of a loan amount. And with that, you'd be stuck with a payback period on that loan. And the payback period is just two years, which is, you know, it, it was fairly surprising when it came out the other day that it would just be for two years. Um, I view it as really just an extra incentive for you to make sure that you go through all the, all the right steps that are required for full forgiveness. And then also the loan has a fixed interest rate of 1%. So when and how can I apply for this? So all businesses technically could have started to apply this past Friday, the third. Now, the problem was there weren't a lot of banks that were even ready to accept applications on Friday. And that's because, you know, as, as I was saying, there was a ton of confusion um, in terms of the inconsistencies that I went over. But also the bank wanted some more guidance from the SBA on some simple things like, like documentation requirements and underwriting standards. So the SBA finally issued some guidance late Thursday night, and then they issued some more guidance on Friday night and then some more on Saturday. So if you're a customer at a bank that's currently not accepting applications, it's really, really important for you to make sure you stay in contact every day with your bank. I, I would say a couple of times a day. Um, and the other thing is that we recommend that you, you've got to get your documentation ready now so that when your bank's ready, you can just expedite this process and get the loan. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> so some of the documentation that's needed includes, you know, any underlying support for the, for the loan amount calculation, you know, like a, like a spreadsheet or, or what have you, and also payroll records that are related to it that will support it like W-2s and W-3s and 941s. We're getting the sense that uh, in working with banks and from hearing from our clients that um, it's possible that some of the required documentation, it may vary a little bit bank to bank. So again, really important to communicate often with your lender. So in summary, there's lots of inconsistencies in this act that are, are driving a lot of confusion out there. Um, the key is to communicate often with your bank and, and um, bend over backwards to get them the information that they need. Um, at our firm, we have a team that's dedicated to helping our clients out with this, uh, particularly with, with either preparing this loan calculation 
uh, assisting them in any way or reviewing it um, and answering all the questions or and, you know any and all questions that we have or they have rather. Um, and we're also helping a lot of our clients prepare a 13 week rolling cash flow uh, forecast so that they can kind of see what what the future holds the, the best the best they can. <clears throat> And so some of the resources that are out there for this, if you want further information, would be our website at dgccpa.com. You can certainly turn to the BSA website and you can certainly go to treasury.gov. Um, there you'll find samples of, of the application and you'll find the, the original act as well as the subsequent guidance. So that's all I have for, for my, uh, my prepared comments. So Rick, let's, let's jump into a few questions. Most of the questions we received ahead of time are related to the loan program. So I'll ask some of those. I think there's one tax question that, that, you, that, we can, that I can answer, but, uh, but most of these questions will be posed to Rick for now. You bet. Um, so let's see. First question that we had was, does the CARES Act require that the architectural firm retain all employees prior to COVID-19 in order to qualify for loans or tax benefits? So the answer there is no. You, you, can, you can qualify, you can, you can let people go. Um, you know, you're still gonna qualify for the loan. It's just a matter of whether or not you'll receive 100% forgiveness if you lay off people. Um, so hopefully, you know, if you, if you, if you have to let, let some people go, you know, hopefully you can bring them back online by June 30th. Okay. The next question that was asked is, are there any records or information we should gather that will be helpful to have for the program besides reading the CARES Act? And I think, I think you may have just answered that a few minutes ago. Yeah, so the other information that you need to have ready would be, you know, your payroll records, the, the calculation of the loan amount, um, you know, the payroll records being 941s, W2s, W3s, and anything else that the bank may ask for. Just, just be ready to, ready to go. When calculating the requested loan amount, it's unclear from the summary released by the Treasury if rent and utilities should be included in the calculation in addition to payroll cost, it is clear that you can use the funds obtained from the loan forward up to 25% if you want to be forgiven. Right, so that's very confusing because they're, what they're telling you is that the loan amount, once you get it, um, can be used to pay for payroll costs, rent utilities. But in order to actually calculate the loan amount, that calculation does not involve um, money spent on rent or utilities. It just includes the payroll costs um, that we went over. So another question is, um, I would like to understand what is the likelihood that a portion of the loan will be forgiven? Okay, so I'd say pretty high. The likelihood's pretty high if you don't lay anybody off or if you don't um, reduce anyone's salary during this period. Um, the whole purpose of that of that forgiven forgiveness provision is to give employers a huge incentive to uh, to just stay put, to not to not lay people off. So if you do all that you're gonna have a very, uh, very strong likelihood that you, the whole thing will be forgiven or a portion. Uh, let's see, the next question is, it would be helpful to go through the interactions and exclusions amongst the loans and tax benefits available in the act. It wasn't immediately obvious and some firms might not be aware that receiving a payroll protection loan makes the firm ineligible for at least some of the tax credits. And, and I agree, it was, it was definitely not immediately obvious and it was, just one of those things that gets buried within any legislation. But as, as I mentioned earlier, if you do plan to, if you obtain a payroll protection loan, then you cannot take the employee retention payroll tax credit. If you are forgiven, if you take a loan and are forgiven a portion of the loan, then you are not eligible for the payroll tax deferral program. Not 
again, there's, there's some guidance still needed as to how that all that works and how the mechanics of all that works. But if you're planning to take the payroll protection loan, paycheck protection loan, and, and also and, and have it forgiven, then you should probably not plan on taking advantage of either of those um, credits and defer, either the credit or deferral. Next question is, I'm a sole proprietor 20 years with one employee for the past one and a half years, trying to figure out what to do and how to do it. One thing looking like a complication, I apparently use a personal checking account, not a business account, so it may not qualify. Any, any so, help? yeah, so I mean, the, I think that you will qualify to, to uh, receive the loan but the fact that you're using a personal checking account doesn't necessarily preclude you, I wouldn't think. Um, but you should, you should, as part of this, like I mentioned before, open up an additional checking account to, to deposit the loan proceeds into um, and to track your spending. So, but I think for your, in your case, there, the bank is going to probably just, uh, I would think, just ask you for a Schedule C. Um, if it hasn't been, if your taxes haven't been finalized for 2019, perhaps there's a there's a P&L summary that you can generate that anything that shows what your earnings were from self-employment. Okay, and a few questions we received just today. Um, This, this one's a long, little longer, but is there a good decision tree for deciding whether to lay employees off and have them take advantage of the increased unemployment benefits or continue to employ them above 75% and pay with PPP? And also what are the advantages and disadvantages of furloughing employees and then bringing them back to near full time in the middle of June to take advantage of the PPP? Yeah, that's a really great question um, that's coming from Mark. And, um, you know, there's no de decision tree that's out there that anyone's prepared that I'm aware of so far, but it certainly would be a worthwhile exercise to put together at some point real soon. Um, but, and th then the advantages of furloughing people and then bringing them back you'd have to make sure you bring them back before June 30th. I think you know that just based on the question that you asked. Um, so the advantage, the real advantage just relates to how much uh, loan forgiveness you would, you would be eligible to, to receive. And just a couple more from the uh, questions received before we started is why wouldn't every small design firm pursue this given the debt forgiveness aspect? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's really, um, this is a really tough question. I mean, we've run into a few clients where, where, you know, they've got $6 million in the bank, for example, they've got $2 million uh, of availability in their line of credit. You know, they haven't had a whole lot of projects that are, um, that have been delayed for this reason or that reason. And they're feeling pretty good, feeling pretty insulated from the pandemic at this point. Um, so really, you know, that kind of comes down to almost like a moral type decision um, that you might be facing. But I mean, make no mistake, if you're feeling this from an economic standpoint, then you shouldn't hesitate to apply for a loan. I mean, you may think that that things are, are looking good or you're, you're insulated, but <clears throat> I mean, that could obviously change tomorrow. Um, you could, you know, and then you know, similarly, you could have that $6 million in the bank. You, you may have started this process or this crisis um, with tremendous backlog, but geez, now, now all the jobs have been, have been uh, delayed, you know, by the, by the, by the city of, of Boston and things change very rapidly and they have changed very rapidly. So it really comes down to a judgment call. Um, so, I mean, if you're feeling that economic uncertainty, just based on the, you know, the 13 week cash flow projections that you may have prepared, just based on the latest, you know, set of information that you have available, which is always changing, by the way, um, you really just make those, you know, have those things just kind of inform your decision and, um, 
but you know, it, it can be, it can be tough. It can be a really tough decision because you know that, you know, I kind of need the money, but I might be, you know, taking away from someone else, some other business that really needs the money um, a lot more. That's really more of a, a judgment call. And finally, one, one last question from the, the, um, from this list. And, and I apologize. We haven't had time to get through everybody, but um, this is a great question here. And I, and not that they are actually all great questions, but this is, I will, I will preface this with um, the person that asked this question. You are certainly not alone with this question because it's, it's, a, it's a question we've wrestled with. Um, and what if I applied already and learned something today indicating we made a wrong assumption? For example, assuming that the average payroll period is the previous 12 months and not the calendar year 2019. Yeah, yep, we're seeing that this a lot. And my advice to you would be, uh, you know, talk to your bank to see if you can revise the calculation if it's not too late. Um, if you can't, if they push back, again, I would say that it's much more important to get that, um, to get that in the queue, get that in the line um, so that you can receive the money. So basically what you're saying is we expect a lot of corrections to some of these numbers, which is not, not to be, not surprising. Right, but it's at the risk of going back and forth, you know, a couple iterations. And um, if you can, if you can somehow just kind of step on it and streamline it and not delay the 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 money from receiving the money, then then that's great. But I mean, you just have to think about the timing of this. Okay, and as I said, we'll try to. We'll, we will. There there are some other questions that were submitted. We'll we'll try to get to those um, and be able to respond to people as, as much as possible. Um, I know there's also some live questions. I don't know, Eric, did we want to go through some of those or, or, or we're sort of pretty much out of time? We're nearing the end, but I think there's one that uh, I, I think people might be interested. What happens if uh, your bank is not offering a PPP loan? Um, do you have recommendations on what people should do to go to other third party lenders? Uh, any thoughts there? I, I think the recommendation is to go try to find a bank that will, will uh, accept your application. Um, the problem there that we've seen is that there are a lot of these larger banks who are making sure that, they, um, that they're taking care of their existing customers before they take care of uh, any new customers. So, um, you know, you're at the risk of just being put on the, in the back of the line. Um, you know, but but again, I think it's really important for you to to stay in touch with your existing bank because you have a late relationship there <clears throat> that you don't have anywhere else. So, you know, like I said, communicate often. And and Rick and Steve, I, were gonna, I wanna thank you so much. Um, we did receive a number of other questions that came in and we will share those with you. And if uh, possible, we'll get those answers out to folks as soon as we can. Um, and as I think the, the really great advice that you gave is uh, to get in touch with your bank and communicate with them and get as much info to them as, as possible in the, the format that they're looking for. And again, uh, the DeChico Goldman website is an incredible source of information. Uh, DGCCPA.com slash coronavirus. Uh, and uh, it's, it's definitely worth taking a look at. Um, I wanna thank all of you for joining us and to please share your feedback at communications at architects.org. You can stay up to date on the latest news at our website, architects.org through Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter, and of course, signing up for our now bi-weekly e-newsletter, Currents. We hope you'll join us on Friday for our next webinar with member firm HGA on healthcare facilities design and COVID-19. Before I go, I wanna take a moment to publicly thank all my colleagues on staff. They're working diligently to keep you up to date with the most current and useful information. And finally, Please join me in thanking Steve Minson and Rick Strout from DGC for joining us today. We know that your lives have been turned upside down and you're probably not getting much time with your families to, to figure out all the information that we need and thank you for sharing your knowledge. Thank you for what you do and doing it so well. And a thank reminder you. to everyone, be safe, be healthy, and be kind. Thank you all. <laughs>